Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter and please feel free to go ahead and dial in your questions, type them in, and we've already got a bunch of questions. They're going to be read to me off camera and uh, let's get started. All right, Dr. Perlmutter, your first question. I've had adverse effects from turmeric. Is there any alternative that you would suggest? So the real reason I like turmeric so much is because its role in activating certain genes that are anti-inflammatory, as well as genes that help turn on the production of antioxidants and detoxification. So it's a super cool uh, herb, uh, spice, and the, the literature that's talked about turmeric really goes back to 3,000 years ago to the Vedic text. But that said, um, there are a certain number of people who just can't use turmeric for one reason or another. Uh, some people get uh, rashes and some people can sneeze and turn, the skin turns red. So what I would say is we still want to activate that same pathway that's protective, reducing inflammation, uh, bumping up antioxidant function, and the pathway is called the NRF2 pathway. And how you can activate the NRF2 pathway is, number one, you're going to love this, drink coffee. Yes, uh, coffee activates the very same pathway that turmeric does. Uh, resveratrol is a uh, very popular a nutritional supplement at the health food store. And truly, you can also activate the same pathway by getting aerobic exercise. So there are lots of cool things that you can do well beyond turmeric uh, to reap its benefits and really act very much in the same way. But you're not alone, whoever uh, uh, asked that question. You have some more folks asking about coffee and red wine. Do you want to talk a little bit more about their benefits? <laughs> I knew I would gain friends with the coffee and the red wine. So uh, both uh, coffee and red wine are really um, great things to consume in, of course, moderation. I mean, a glass or two of red wine each day uh, for men and maybe no more than one glass a day for women. The reason being that coffee is low in sugar, so I'm fine with that, but it is very rich in what are called polyphenols. And polyphenols are chemicals that are in and of themselves antioxidants and also act as um, nutrients for the good levels, the good type of bacteria that live within the microbiome, that live within your gut. So I'm all over it, uh, and this may well explain the so-called French paradox, uh, where the French people are thought to eat food that is not ideal. But you know, now that I think about it, the reason we talked about the French paradox over the years is because the French had such a high-fat diet, and we all thought that was a horrible thing. Well, now there is no French paradox, because it turns out they were eating the right diet all along. Uh, they eat less carbs than we do here in, in America. Uh, the other part of that question, I think, dealt with coffee. There are some direct effects of coffee uh, in terms of uh, its polyphenol co content and also its caffeine content, both of which are now associated with a 20% risk reduction from the European literature in uh, rather risk for dementia reduced by 20%. Uh, in a four-year study in people having from three to five cups of coffee each day. There's also a reduction in risk of progression of um, gallbladder uh, issues, and there has been some discussion of perhaps a slightly lowered risk of diabetes mellitus type 2. So um, I'm all for it. The downsides of coffee, of course, can be up uh, enhancing your blood pressure, increasing your blood pressure, uh, uh, heart irregularities in terms of heart beat, and also even raising your heart rate. There's been some discussion of uh, some delivery issues of women uh, having babies having uh, issues if they were heavy caffeine consumers. Uh, so now as we're talking about coffee, we had a lot of people ask, what about green tea and the benefits similar? So green tea is, a, is very uh, reasonable as well. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, there are um, uh, things in, in green tea like the catechins that act as anti-inflammatories and also um, we can reap the benefits of uh, green tea even if it's decaffeinated and in fact there are some uh, upsides of uh, coffee even that has been decaffeinated to get back to our previous discussion so I think green tea is a very um, helpful beverage to consume. Uh, another question we've seen, we've had a, a couple people actually asked about fecal transplant already. Uh, and they want to know what they can do to help, bring, what can we as patients do to help to bring about a, a revolution towards this sort of treatment in the United States? Well, that's a great question. And uh, the reason I included those two cases of fecal transplant in uh, Brain Maker to, it was to really drive home the point as to um, what is the role of the microbiome and what happens when it goes bad and what happens when it is reset using fecal microbial transplant. So 
Uh, as a, a general statement, I don't do the procedure, but many of my patients have undergone it, either doing it themselves or going to facilities that will do that. I mean, there are places around the country now that will do that. And we know that in more than 150 hospitals in America right now, fecal microbial transplant is being performed as a treatment for Clostridium difficile. My hope is that uh, BrainMaker is going to break the ice and really allow people to um, recognize that this is a very, very powerful therapeutic modality, a powerful technique, and understand that uh, we've got to get past the ick factor uh, and recognize how powerful this is. I, I certainly feel there's uh, profound importance in terms of making sure that donors uh, for fecal microbial transplant are adequately screened, and we know that at least the process that the hospitals in America are using is one that includes a vigorous screening program. I believe that in the future, as in just maybe the next three to five years, we're going to see widespread application of this process. Um, we now know that University of Arizona has just completed recruiting autistic patients to treat them with fecal microbial transplant because uh, we do know that, for example, the microbiome of the autistic child is very much disrupted. And I reported a case in our book, BrainMaker, uh, of a child having significant recovery, gaining back the ability to speak, uh, gaining back the ability to socially interact by undergoing a fecal transplant. And if you visit drperlmutter.com, drperlmutter.com, our website, uh, we'll tweet that in. We actually have video of, of Jason uh, after he's received this procedure uh, with commentary. So I, uh, it, those are wonderful questions, and I know that uh, now that BrainMaker is out as of today, this is going to pave the way for a huge amount of discussion on this topic. Excellent. And as that was coming, we had one question come in uh, to see if you had any suggestions for folks with chronic migraines. So the question is about chronic migraine headaches, and I'd say step one is gluten-free. Who knew? Uh, dating back to the days of grain brain, uh, 18 months ago or whenever that was, uh, that is one of our best ways of, re of helping these individuals with this inflammatory disorder. But beyond that, understand that inflammation comes from the gut. So I would say in addition to gluten-free, target the gut, target the gut bacteria with aggressive probiotics, eating probiotic food, prebiotic food, uh, and undergo food sensitivity testing. Find out beyond gluten what you need to eliminate. While you're taking a drink, I'll say back uh, on the subject of coffee for a moment. We have folks asking. Kombucha, by the way. Oh, <laughs> With a bite. <laughs> uh, folks just asking specifically about coffee. If you feel there are any concerns for folks who uh, it might be harmful for autoimmune patients or folks who have epilepsy. I would, again, I'm not your doctor, <clears throat> though I play one on uh, Twitter. Um, I would say that it's, uh, it is something to discuss with your treating physician because we're getting into medical treatment here. Uh, in my practice, I've not had any real issues of concern in dealing with my patients with uh, seizures in terms of caffeine consumption, obviously within moderation. And with respect to autoimmune disease, again, we're healing the gut. We're trying to reduce the permeability or the leaky gut, and I think coffee can, is likely going to be helping us in that regard. Excellent. Uh, we just had someone ask about probiotics. Are there any side effects we should be concerned about? There are people who don't tolerate all, all kinds of things, and I think a lot of times when people say they don't tolerate a, a probiotic that they may be taking, I'd say you've got to be careful of additives and fillers. Uh, in my experience, that's the biggest uh, issue in terms of not tolerating the probiotic. So I would try to get a, a supplement that doesn't really have any additives other and fillers because it, rather than the bacteria themselves, I think that's what people tend to have problems with. Uh, somebody said that they get brain fog with coughing. Well, again, uh, we're all different, and uh, I'm providing the broad strokes here in, in terms of what makes sense, what does a current leading-edge peer-reviewed science validate. That's what BrainMaker was built on. Uh, but everyone is different. I mean, um, you have to uh, experiment with your life and see what you tolerate and what you don't tolerate. So. Um, I wouldn't say uh, that's hugely unusual. It wouldn't be the strangest reaction I ever heard. 
back uh, on the subject of probiotics, we've had a couple folks ask, uh, what should one look for when buying a probiotic supplement? That's a great question, and I think that's a moving target. And I, really what we want to be sure of is that you have viability in the, in the supplement that you may be taking. In other words, um, that when you're taking a supplement, you've got to be sure that these uh, bacterial organisms are going to remain alive and be alive uh, at the time you take that supplement. So you can find nutritional supplements that, uh, 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 probiotics that have uh, a certain number, a certain billion number of um, what are called CFUs, col colony forming units, but that might be at the time of manufacture. So you really want to look at products that are created in such a way and verified in such a way that the product actually contains at the time of consumption uh, that number or close to that number of viable organisms. The other thing you want to look for is a pretty vast array of, of different types of organisms. I mean, it's, it's all interesting that you might just take Lactobacillus acidophilus as one species, but that said, we want to look for a pretty wide array. In BrainMaker, I list the core five uh, bacterial species that you should look for, organisms like Lactobacillus plantarum, Lactobacillus acidophilus, Bifidobacterium brevis, Lactobacillus longum, and um, these are all, I think, a very uh, unique set of core species that are um, that are really helpful in healing the gut and in reducing inflammation. We have a question, what is more effective, prebiotics or probiotics? Well, I don't think you can do a head-to-head, -head. we're talking apples and oranges here, you can't really do a head-to-head -head comparison uh, of prebiotic fiber, which is helpful because it augments the growth of good bacteria in the gut, uh, and as such has great clinical application. Uh, we've now seen a study recently published that demonstrated actually a significant improvement in children with asthma by simply giving them prebiotic fiber. Uh, the probiotics and the probiotic foods, the fermented foods, kimchi, uh, fermented uh, beverages like kombucha and cultured yogurt, for example, are um, foods that actually contain uh, high levels of probiotic organisms. So the, I'm not trying to get away from the question, but the point is these things work synergistically. These things work together but they come at the problem from kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. They work together to augment the growth of good bacteria, so I think, as we talked about in BrainMaker, uh, it's really good to have both of these on, boards. They're on board. They're really good choices. Is kombucha enough, or do you need to supplement that? So kombucha is going to give you an array of organisms, and I would say that uh, adding fermented foods, other fermented foods like kimchi, uh, like fermented dairy products are going to give you different arrays of, of organisms. Uh, it'll probably take us to the uh, the topic of well, how do you protect your microbiome in the first place. So maybe I'll, I'll take a breather here and hope that somebody asks that question. Knowing you guys is probably going to be the next question, right? <laughs> uh, I'll give you a little transition here. Uh, we have somebody asking, uh, what's your take on MCT oil versus coconut oil? Well, coconut oil is a source of MCT oil, and I think if you're really going for the powering of, of your brain uh, in terms of uh, keto, uh, ketogenesis and becoming ketotic, I'd say go for the MCT oil. But I would also say that I think that there are other health supportive properties of uh, coconut oil uh, that are not in refined MCT oil. So it's, it's not a necessarily straightforward answer. At the end of the day, I think I'm going to probably vote for the coconut oil as being a better product um, as, and you know, making sure that it's an organic product. Very, very high in saturated fat. That's actually good news. More than 90% of the fat in coconut oil is saturated. And the latest literature uh, that just came out published about, well, it wasn't the latest literature, but some literature that came out was published 3,000 years ago in the Vedic text that calls our attention to the life and health supportive uh, properties of coconut oil. Follow up to that, how much coconut oil do you recommend? I think a tablespoon or two each day is reasonable. Um, you can use it, uh, put it in your coffee, uh, for example, that's become extremely popular these days. Uh, you can use it uh, as a, an additive to your foods when you're cooking. Uh, so I think one to two tablespoons a day for an adult is a reasonable dosage. Uh, someone's asking here, in addition to going gluten-free, how important is it to go sugar-free? Uh, fundamental. 
So uh, we're, these questions are sort of dating back to, to grain brain. And as you know, that was the central thesis of grain brain. That is go gluten-free and get rid of the sugar, get rid of the carbs. And that said, how intriguing it is now that the United States uh, Dietary Advisory Committee came out about six weeks ago and affirmed that we've all got to cut back, well, not everybody, but those who are eating carbs and sugars have got to cut back on their consumption of these things because uh, this is where we're running into trouble. And um, uh, it's not the fat. Fat is, is your friend. We've got to welcome fat back to the table. And, and I think these two things run hand in hand. Uh, refined sugar is detrimental directly to your body, increasing inflammation, increasing the production of free radicals. And as we discuss now in Brain Maker, sugar, a high sugar diet, changes the milieu, changes the complexion of the bacteria in your gut and creates a, an array of bacteria that favor inflammation and favor the extraction of more calories from your food, paving the way for things like diabetes and obesity. So, you know, it's huge. The most important factor influencing the health of your gut bacteria uh, is, in fact, your food choice. Okay. Uh, this one just came in. Uh, what is your opinion on vegetable juicing? I love vegetable juicing, and I think the issue is to make sure that you choose your vegetables wisely. And the, uh, for example, you, you know, you can have a nice 12 ounce glass of carrot juice, and that may seem like, you know, mana from heaven, but th the bottom line is that's a very powerful sugar load. So I think if you're juicing low carb vegetables, you know, put leafy greens, for example, put broccoli into your vegetable juice. The only downside, the only downside, but one of the, my objections is the fact that when you do that, most juicers are extracting the pulp. And the pulp is where the fiber lives, and the fiber is not this inert crap that you want to throw away. It's very, very important. Uh, as we're now learning, it's important for the gut. So there are a couple of juicers that are out there that will allow you to gain back the fiber while you're extracting the juice and, and getting the benefits of the juice as well. So that stuff that most people seem to be throwing out, that's very, very valuable. Great. Dr. Parmer, uh, what recommend, recommendations do you have for children who exhibit symptoms of ADHD, undiagnosed or otherwise? Um, and if they're already taking a probiotic, what other uh, suggestions do you have to improve their gut health? So ADHD is a big issue here in America. Beyond children, we now know that 4% of American adults have been given that diagnosis. And uh, as far as our children go, more than 6.4 million American children now carry that diagnosis. And two thirds of them are receiving medications, the long-term consequences of which are not even understood, have never even been studied. So what happens is kids start looking out the window uh, in uh, school, and are not getting their homework turned in on time, the next thing you know they're being put on amphetamines. That's what's going on. I, I shortened it up a little bit, but the reality is that's what's happening. And I think that's scary business. When we recognize that 85% of the ADHD drugs uh, used on the planet are used right here in America, that should tell us something. So I find that when we reduce inflammation in children, they're much more able to pay attention in school. And inflammation, as you will read in Brain Maker, is coming from the gut. So we've got to target the gut right off the bat. And it happens to coincide with how that child was born in the first place. There's a tripling of risk of ADHD in kids born by C-section. Why is that important? Because when a kid is born naturally through the birth canal, that's when he or she obtains his or her first exposure to bacteria that live in the birth canal. That's how they create their first microbiome. Kids born by C-section don't have that opportunity, and that might well be what increases their risk for ADHD. The next fly in the ointment is the massive bombardment of a kid's gut bacteria that happens when they are given antibiotics with every sore ear or every cold or every sniffle. We've got to stop doing that. And it's not just me. Uh, saying that, we're, you know, we're reading uh, reports in the Journal of the American Medical Association and in the Lancet that are telling us that we're not doing our kids any service by loading them with antibiotics. In fact, we're paving the way for gut issues that lead to inflammation that may well explain the increased risk of ADHD in children who've had multiple exposures to antibiotics. So from a preventive standpoint, the keys are 
Number one, avoid C-section if that's possible. It's a wonderful procedure, but it's grossly overused. One third of births in America now uh, happens by C-section. Uh, number two, try to back down on the antibiotics that kids get. Number three, do your very best to breastfeed your children. Uh, if in fact uh, there is this diagnosis and kids are not paying attention at school, I'm a big proponent in terms of gut rehab with lots of probiotics, but beyond that, we found great success in using an omega-3 that you can get at your health food store that's called DHA. So this is not just, again, me telling you that. A wonderful study from Israel uh, looked at actually treating kids with ADHD by just uh, giving them this omega-3 that you can buy at the health food store uh, with no prescription. So what I'm saying is prior to filling that prescription for whatever the drug is, the amphetamine, the stimulant uh, drug for ADHD, consider going gluten-free, cutting back on the kids' sugars, uh, adding in a probiotic, adding in DHA, uh, and I would certainly give that a shot. So, uh, a couple questions. You mentioned Brain Maker. How is Brain Maker different than Grain Brain? The central tenets of Grain Brain focused on the uh, effects of eating too many carbohydrates, not getting enough fat to nurture the brain, and the powerfully detrimental role of gluten as it relates to inflammation and as it directly relates, therefore, to the brain. Uh, what we now understand that to a significant degree, those factors described in grain brain, gluten, uh, sugar in the diet, high carbs in the diet, lack of fiber, lack of good fat, do their damage by altering the gut bacteria, altering this hundred trillion organisms that live within your gut uh, should now be considered as an organ in and of itself. A three pound uh, area of your body that controls virtually every aspect of your, of your metabolism, controls inflammation, which is the cornerstone of ADHD, autism, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, arthritis, diabetes, and cancer. So we now have, through BrainMaker, a full understanding as to why the dietary recommendations in Grain Brain were absolutely on target. But what Brain, Grain, uh, what Brain Maker now talks about is, first of all, what are we doing to our gut bacteria that paves the way for disease? What are the issues in our environment that we can avoid that are paving the way for brain failure? That's the key of BrainMaker. And beyond that, the empowering part of BrainMaker is, therefore, what do I do to fix it? How can I fix this problem? And, and that's what's going on with this book. And, you know, it's now the number one book in America in neurology, in neurological diseases uh, on Amazon. And it's because people are finally making this connection between the gut and the brain. These are not disparate organs that live apart from each other. Everything going on in your gut that is dictated by your dietary and other environmental choices is directly affecting your brain right now and determining the destiny of your brain in the long term. That's what Brain Maker is all about. So uh, is dairy toxic like gluten? There are some people who don't tolerate casein, uh, cow's casein, uh, and they probably can identify themselves by having issues when they use dairy products well beyond being lactose intolerant, they may have reactions when consuming dairy products. But unlike lactose, these are people who have uh, reactions that are not uh, immediate. They don't get diarrhea immediately, but they may, if they stop consuming dairy products and therefore casein, uh, they may have improvements that may take days or weeks. Um, so uh, it's, it's an issue for some people, but certainly not uh, to the scope that gluten-containing foods are in terms of population numbers. Great, so we've had uh, someone else ask, uh, you know, on the topic of oils, besides MCT, besides olive, are there any other oils you recommend that we incorporate into the diet? I sure do. Oil is basically liquid fat, and uh, it, it takes us to this discussion of the fats that we consume, uh, of uh, consuming things like grass-fed beef, uh, wild fish that's rich in oils, rich in omega-3s like DHA, uh, um, free-range eggs, free-range poultry. Uh, nuts and seeds, uh, those are some good sources of what are called monounsaturated fats. So uh, those are some other oil type food, uh, or foods that do contain oils that I think you should absolutely 
uh, gravitate to. Those are really helpful for you. And you know, keep in mind though that uh, I really want you to welcome back to your plate uh, some of the fermented foods. And many of you have never had fermented foods, so that will be a first time for you. But understand that even sauerkraut is fermented, pickles are fermented, and you can now have uh, at the grocery store fermented meat, fermented fish, and even fermented eggs. So I really want you to start to embrace that as being a really important key to health and also recognize again how important it is to have prebiotic fiber uh, at your, uh, on your plate a couple of times a day. And those are foods like dandelion greens, uh, jicama or Mexican yam, uh, Jerusalem artichoke, garlic, leeks, onions, and you can even buy great sources of uh, prebiotic fiber like inulin uh, in the form of things like acacia gum that you can find at the health food store. So these are the keys to health. These are the ways that you're going to rehab your gut bacteria, reduce autoimmunity, reduce inflammation, uh, which is what Brain Maker is all about. Now, on the topic of uh, supplements, we've had somebody ask, you know, what's your take on, and do you suggest cod liver oil and or vitamin D? Yes and yes. Uh, I, I think um, pharmaceutical grade uh, cod liver oil, in other words, purified cod liver oil, is a terrific um, source of DHA. Uh, we talked about DHA earlier in terms of its role uh, in terms of reducing inflammation and helping as an antioxidant. But beyond that, DHA actually amps up your body's production of what's called BDNF, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor, growth hormone for the brain. So I'm down for uh, cod liver oil, and uh, I think most of us are, are, are careful not to get too much sun anymore, and really, uh, it's been only very, very recently that we put clothes on. So, you know, our bodies are designed, <laughs> I don't take this the wrong way, but to manufacture the right levels of vitamin D, we pretty much need to run around naked all the time and not, ta not take cholesterol-lowering drugs because your body in the sun, no clothes, uses your body's cholesterol to manufacture vitamin D. So we're taking away our ability to make vitamin D on all counts. So I'm very big on vitamin D3 supplementation with the caveat that you should have at regular intervals, maybe once or twice a year, your doctor check your vitamin D level and make sure that it's about in the middle of what is called the therapeutic range. Now the therapeutic range goes between 30 and 100 nanograms per milliliter. Mm, I think that's right. Well, it's 30 and 100 I, I here in America. It's, it's a different uh, parameter in um, Canada. So I'd like you to shoot for maybe 60, 70, or 80 on that scale as opposed to your level being 34 and your doctor saying, oh, you're in the normal range. Not good enough, in my opinion. So, uh, <clears throat> when is the right time for probiotics? Well, sometimes somebody once asked me, um, what's the best time to go fishing? And my answer is anytime. So, probiotics, I'd say anytime. Ideally, it'd be good to take your probiotics in the morning on an empty stomach before you've eaten. Because <clears throat> the biggest uh, gauntlet for the probiotics is getting by the stomach acid. And once you've eaten, you've amped up your stomach acid production. So you really want to hit those probiotics early on before you really have eaten and start turning on stomach acid. Now, we actually just had uh, somebody come in from Twitter and ask on the topic of artificial sweeteners, uh, the, dam it's the damage that they can do to our microbiome is well documented. Does that go for stevia as well? I think uh, that uh, not so much. I think um, stevia is a quasi-natural product, as you know. Uh, it actually um, comes uh, from a plant, and as such, I think uh, people can get away. If you have to have, um, if you have to have a sweetener, I think using some stevia is not the worst idea. I actually have recipes in Grain Brain using stevia. Uh, if you really must, it, you're not going to eat a food unless it has some sweetener. So I think you can get away with stevia. Um, so uh, I think that's that's reasonable. However. Uh, the literature with respect to changes in the microbiome as uh, a consequence of exposure to artificial sweeteners, non-natural sweeteners, I think is very, very compelling. And I think that the new research out of Israel that looked at the changes in the microbiome from artificial sweeteners paving the way for diabetes type 2 is very, very compelling, as well as weight gain from eating, from drinking non-sugar containing beverages. Be virtually. Um, 
beverages that are, are calorie free making you fat. Who knew? Turns out that what the, what the Israeli uh, researchers demonstrated actually in their study was that this is happening because of changes in the microbiome, changes in the gut bacteria when people are exposed to uh, aspartame. All right, so I'm just going to let everybody out there know we, we're going to do about another five minutes here. So if you have questions, get them in now. And the next question we have also, uh, somebody just sent this in here and they said it on Twitter earlier. Um, you know, for someone who might have a family member with dementia or Alzheimer that's currently in a nursing home or an assisted living facility, what are the sort of questions and things we should be talking to the caretakers about to help make sure that our loved ones are getting the right treatment? Well, I've been through that, and I will tell you that making the changes at the, um, at the nursing home or assisted uh, living facility is very, very difficult. Uh, by and large, the food choices available are awful, uh, and making changes in those food choices is very, very difficult, um, so you kind of have to do it yourself. Uh, if it's the kind of facility where you can stock the refrigerator and make uh, changes, that's really good. And again, the diet that uh, I use in uh, my practice is one that is extremely low in carbohydrate. We know that elevations of blood sugar are absolutely toxic to the brain. Even mild elevations of blood sugar pave the way for dementia as published in August 2013 in the New England Journal of Medicine. So. It's a diet that's higher in fat. If it can be ketogenic, that's good. You don't want to do that, of course, if the patient is diabetic already. Um, you want to be able to titrate the vitamin D level up, as we've talked about. But now we know that Alzheimer's is an inflammatory condition of the brain. We've got to do everything we can to reduce inflammation. And we actually dedicated a, a significant part of the book in talking about this and actually cite data from uh, England, uh, from Oxford, that looks at the relationship of gut bacterial changes, reduction in the diversity of gut bacteria, to risk of developing Alzheimer's in those countries where we've lost gut bacterial diversity. That's basically Western countries as opposed to places like Sub-Saharan Africa where they've got a much richer uh, array of bacteria in the gut and uh, their incidence of Alzheimer's is dramatically lower. Um, if you have a loved one in a nursing home, you've got to get them to exercise every day. Uh, if it's walking with the walker, that's cool. If, it's, if you can get them on a, um, a stationary bike, that would be fantastic. So exercise increases brain-derived neurotrophic factor and in studies uh, writ, uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, Dr. Erickson has demonstrated actual improvement in memory in individuals who engage in aerobic exercise. Why? Because aerobic exercise turns on the growth of new brain cells and is, in fact, the most powerful medicine you can get, prescription or non-prescription. Uh, you mentioned exercise. Somebody just uh, commented, what is your opinion on burst training exercise? I, that's become very popular, and I think there are certainly upsides to that. But uh, in addition, uh, as per the New York Times uh, last week, uh, we're now learning that in comparison studies, at least for uh, adults, that less strenuous exercise over a more prolonged period of time seems to be associated with uh, reduction of risk of, of early death and basically longevity. What we do know, at least in terms of the brain, is we need the aerobic part of the equation. So. Uh, with interval training, for example, when you reach a higher heart rate, uh, and I don't, you don't know, uh, I can't tell you what heart rate that would be. What I generally recommend to, to patients is uh, choose a heart rate of 180 minus your age uh, as a very, very crude estimate of where you should target if you're in reasonable shape. You want to try to hold that heart rate for 20 minutes. Uh, that is what has been demonstrated to be most effective in terms of bumping up your BDNF leading to the growth of new brain cells, leading to the better synaptogenesis, the connection of one brain cell to the next. Uh, one last question. Okay. So, uh, probiotics and diarrhea, is that a good combination or a bad combination? Well, as a matter of fact, probiotics are used to treat diarrhea and in, in multiple studies. Um, in children, it's been demonstrated that uh, those kids taking probiotics, uh, especially in third world countries, have significantly a lower risk of getting a diarrhea, and as you may know, in uh, some third world countries, this is a major cause of, of infantile and childhood death. So we can offset that 
by paying attention to gut bacteria, and in this case, intervening uh, with the use of probiotics? That's an excellent question. And I will tell you that you'll hear a lot more uh, from our team about uh, our outreach uh, to make probiotics available in third world countries uh, moving forward over the next couple of years. So uh, that's our last question. Let me say a thank you for all of you who participated. Um, it's, it's, today's the launch of BrainMaker and it's going really, really well. Uh, we're already getting positive commentary on Amazon and um, I will be on Fox and Friends uh, this Saturday morning. I don't know what time yet, uh, but uh, watch that. And if you want to, go to the media page of drperlmutter.com. That's drperlmutter.com. And you can see uh, tomorrow I'll be in many cities around uh, America with satellite uplink. And maybe I'll be in your hometown, who knows. But a lot of online uh, interviews, a lot of um, podcasts are coming up as well, a whole bunch of them. So uh, pay attention to those, and I'm um, hoping that you find this information helpful. Let me just ask my team here if there's anything I neglected to say. Wonderful. I would just say if you didn't get your question answered today, uh, be sure to join Dr. Perlmutter on Twitter and Facebook, Dr. David Perlmutter. And also give us your feedback as well on how this went this evening because it's the technology seems really easy and I'm happy to do it again and again.